This show is not intended for the politically correct or the close-minded. Enter at the risk of opening your eyes. You have been warned. Why does the media attack an issue? To get prime time ratings? In my line of work, you gotta keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. A moment comes when we step out from the old to the new. And when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. The kind of catapult of propaganda. You are listening to Open Eyes with your host, Ira Robinson. From the normal to the paranormal, from government cover-ups to the depths of our consciousness, we aim to explore all things. From the dawn of prehistory to current events, no topic is forbidden and nothing remains hidden. No more secrets. Open your eyes and open your mind to the fact that life as we know it is not as we have been taught. Join us at LateNightInTheMidlands.com or OpenEyesNetwork.com as we take this brief journey through the depths of the cosmos and explore what it really means to be human. Many peoples have sacrificed their liberties only to learn to their sorrow that deceit and mockery. Poverty and tyranny are their reward. Whether you're online or offline, intercontinental or intergalactic, hello, and welcome to another fun and exciting edition of Open Eyes. <laughs> Folks, I uh, I got a lot on my plate tonight for you guys. I, I think that this is going to be a topic that you guys are going to get a lot out of. For me... The, the topic of consciousness and anything relating to the consciousness is a fascinating subject for me. And, and I, I talk about it a lot because, well, it, it's, of course, one of my main interests. <laughs> so a lot of things that I do uh, sort of fall into that realm of things. And, and I relate a lot of what I talk about to it. Because I've done a lot of studies of, of it over the years. I've done a lot of research when it comes to the consciousness and, and what people think of it, what science thinks of it, what people throughout history have thought of it, anything relating to it, how we think, how we act, how we perceive ourselves, how the soul is perceived, all of that stuff wrapped into one little concept called the consciousness. I love the subject, and I hope that you guys do too. I hope that you guys get a lot out of tonight's topic. So I'm going to be talking about consciousness and things relating maybe to the paranormal relating to consciousness. How does it interact with it? Does it interact with it? Is some of the things that go on with the consciousness an explanation for the paranormal and that sort of thing? We'll get into all of that, I think, and, and I hope that, that you guys find the topic as fascinating as I do. <laughs> Before I get to the news, I want to give a quick thank you for my radio affiliates, um, Late Night in the Midlands and K98 Talk. Thank you guys for running my show. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to have my voice be heard by many more people because of you is it's it's a possibility <laughs> and my little diatribes that I do my little monologues I, I hope that you guys have been enjoying the show so far I've been getting a lot of really good feedback about it all and and I I just really appreciate every one of you so for the news tonight I, I ran across a few stories that I, I had to kind of shake my head at <laughs> And uh, I, I wanted to br bring them to your attention because I, I thought that they were important to take note of. Uh, so this this uh, first story 
is one that I know a lot of people in the chat room had had been talking about at one point in time. And um, it's one that I've paid attention to because I've, I've had a lot of questions about it myself. Uh, autopsies are being released for family found dead in Springville home with cups of red liquid. Uh, In the article, it says authorities said the official cause of death for the parents, Benjamin and Christy Strack, is suicide, homicide for the two youngest children, and it could not be determined for the 14 year old son. Police said the autopsy's drug toxicity caused all five deaths. That's not the end of the story, but however, uh, officials said friends and family told them that Benjamin and Christy said that they were concerned with the evil in the world, a pending apocalypse, and wanted to escape the impending doom. Now, the reason why I brought this up is because I I hear this actually, this type of of thinking a lot in the circles that I follow and in the trends that I follow because of what I do here on Open Eyes. We, We talk about a lot of subjects that are out there, yeah, fringy, whatever it is that you want to say, but not in a negative way. We, we, I mean, I try to do everything that I do to not put a doom and gloom spin on different things that I talk about. I try to leave you guys with as much of a positive outlook on things as I possibly can, given the state of the news cycles that go on. I try to bring truth. And... Uh, when when you're following in this kind of of realm in this in this alternative style of thinking you run across a lot of people that talk a lot about subjects that would be apocalyptic as they say or armageddonish or end of the world topics a lot of the eschatology that goes on with all of that and the problem is that a lot of people out there spread this kind of stuff without really ever considering who's listening and what they might do about it. Uh, A a great example that I can think right off the top of my head is, is regarding the, the whole Zeta talk issues and some of the things that have gone on with that over the years and how the, um, Zeta Talk blog was essentially putting out information saying, oh, doom and gloom, the end of the world is coming. You should kill your pets to save them from the, the horrors that are coming. And people did. People actually did go and kill their pets. And people did actually go and, and kill their children and so on and so forth because of this information that was released. And it was all bunk. It was all a lie. It was all... It was all BS. And was the was it done with the best of intentions in mind? Maybe. Was it done with a, a profit motive in mind? That's more likely. I mean, a lot of times these these doom and gloomers, these these people that are out there spreading oh 2012 is coming to an end and, oh, the world is ending and, oh, there's an asteroid coming that's going to hit us. I mean, look, we just had this big asteroid flyby, okay, that that just went past the Earth. And even though there was even even half of a minuscule chance that this thing would have any kind of impact on the planet, there were still people that were out there that were – doom and glooming with it that we're saying, Oh, well, we're all going to die. This is, this is the end of the world as we know it. And, and so on and so forth. And a lot of times when you see that kind of person doing this, they're out to sell something. They're out to, to make a profit in all of this. It, it by and large, that's how it goes. You'll, you'll look at their websites and, Oh, the, this event is coming. So buy my survival products. I have them on sale right now for 75% off and you'll get a great deal and it'll be here in time for the the whole event to take place and you'll be able to survive it because now you have all this food on hand and now you have 
the ability to survive and go dig a hole out in the ground because you're going to need a place to to put it. This is this is how it goes. And a lot of people take advantage of those who don't maybe think critically about the events that are occurring and, well, fall into the traps with it all. It's how it goes. It, this, this type of thing has been around since the beginning of human history. There have been people that have said things are coming to an end. People believe them. And then those people who say things are coming to an end, but here I have things that will help you to survive. <laughs> you see, it's it's all a profit motive. There, there's P-R-O-F-I-T involved in the P-R-O-P-H-E-T. That's how it goes. If they have actually the best of intentions in mind and they're not out to sell something, a lot of times also what goes on is it, it's, it becomes a form of idol worship for the people. So you have a situation where a person becomes addicted to the feelings of, Oh, well, people are paying attention to me. So I have to keep fulfilling that, that addiction. I have to keep fulfilling that need for, uh, my worshipers. (laughs) If you listen to, uh, my episode from last week, actually on Monday of last week, I talked about emotional addictions and some of the things that are involved with it and how they develop and, and what happens as an extension of them. And this falls really right into that category of things. It's not only a thing of the person who is involved in making the prediction being uh, addicted to the feeling of being worshipped, essentially. And, and I don't mean literally bowing, oh, 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 bowing and scraping before them. But when people get attention like that, they're, they're becoming an, an idol of sorts to the person that's looking at them. And then you have the people who are actually um, listening to the people over and over, and they are fulfilling an addiction to not only be worshiping this person, and a lot of times they'll just follow the same person over and over again, but they're also fulfilling an an emotional addiction to being addicted to the, the doom pornography and that fulfills that type of an emotional need. So with this situation in particular, this news story in particular, these people took a story that someone had told them and, and went a step way beyond way too far. They not only killed themselves, they killed their children as well just to escape the impending doom. And I I do, I see this type of thing a lot. This type of thing happens a lot more often than you'd like to, to realize it really does. I have actually known a couple of people in my, in my personal life that have succumbed to this type of thinking and it's a horrible thing. It really is. I, I, it's just, it's very horrible. Let me just put it to you that way. But, um, even, even having dealings with people. I deal with a lot of people, especially those that have um, issues that they're wanting to have resolved or wanting help with. They come to me for help because I can help them out with it. And a lot of times they, they will ask me questions like, or, or, or make statements to me. Like I, I feel like the, the end of the world is coming should I kill my children? Should I, should I just relieve them of the pain? And it's like, good God, no, don't, don't even consider that. Don't even think about that. But there, there really are people that are out there and a lot of them that have this kind of thought in mind. A lot of people out there are thinking to themselves, should I have a child? Should I even get pregnant? Because what kind of world am I bringing them into? Look, I mean, the world's going to be ending in in two years, in five years, whatever. And I mean, these the, these women, these these ladies, they they really do have this thought in their mind: Why should I bring a child into this world that's going to end really damn soon? And that's a horrific way to think. But they have 
become overwhelmed by these people that are out there that put out this doom pornography over and over and over again. And this is the result. Guys, seriously, when it comes to this kind of stuff, when it comes to the end of the world stuff and all of that, listen, it doesn't matter when the world is going to end. Here, here's my, here's, if, if, if you want my take on it, this is, this is the way you guys need to think. It doesn't matter where the, whether the world is going to end tomorrow or next year or the year after that. It doesn't matter. What matters is right now. What matters is this moment in time. You're not guaranteed to take another breath. So what are you doing right now to improve the world around you? What are you doing right now to improve the, the lives of your children or to those that you love? What are you doing right now to make the world a better place? Are you focused on the negative or are you focused on the positive? Are you focused on trying to spread love or are you focused on trying to spread doom? You see, you're not guaranteed another breath. You're not guaranteed to even be here by the time that the world is supposedly coming to an end. So what does it matter? It's what you do right now that makes a difference. It's what you do right now that might actually avert the end of the world. You don't know. Listen, you could, you could go out and give the gift of, of a, of a jacket that you've got sitting in your closet to a homeless person. And that homeless person could then survive and not only survive, but could become a driving force to make a difference in the world. And you just don't know, but you just made the difference that that person stayed alive. You could go to, to the grocery store, <clears throat> excuse me, you could go to the grocery store, smile at somebody just at random, just give them a smile out of the kindness of your heart. And that person could then go home and their life could be changed because maybe before that smile, they were thinking, you know, today is the day I'm going to end things. People just don't care anymore. People just don't give a crap anymore about other people. But you smiled at them. You gave them a smile. And now they walk home. They walk into their house thinking, you know, maybe there is hope for this world after all. Maybe today isn't the day that I do it. You just don't know, guys. You don't know how much of a difference you make every moment of every day. That's what's important to concentrate on. It doesn't matter when the world is going to end. Stop asking the question. Stop worrying about it. Worry about what's going on right here, right now. That's what makes the difference. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so, Facebook is declaring war on misinformation. And this story almost kind of follows into the, the doom and gloom stories that you see going on all over the place, because a lot of them do end up on Facebook and Twitter. <clears throat> the old refrain that it, is that a lie spreads halfway around the world before the truth puts its plant, puts its pants on Facebook declared this week that it wants to help the truth get to the party earlier. In a blog post on Tuesday, Facebook announced that it would start labeling suspected hoaxes and fake news with a warning, as well as reduce the appearance of posts with misinformation in the news feed. You will start seeing this label on Facebook posts with news that is too good or too horrible to be true. And basically the, the uh, post will have listed on it the uh, user community has declared that this news story is likely a fake or likely false information. Facebook's decision to help stop the spread of lies started with a study called rumor cascades conducted in 2013 by its data science team. That's the same team that brought us the infamous emotion contagion study. Do you guys remember hearing about that? That's the study that basically they, they were manipulating people with, with fake posts so that they could see how users respond to different uh, news and information that's put out on the news feeds. 
In the summer of 2013, the Facebook research uh, researchers sorry, looked at users who had posted false information on the site, thinking that it was true. They were able to identify uh, fake stuff en masse by pulling in posts where the user's friends had put links in the comments to rumor debunking site Snopes.com. <clears throat> Which doesn't always have its information correct, by the way. I will just state that right now. Two examples the researchers mentioned of fake news spreading on the site like wildfire that summer were a photo that claimed to be Trayvon Martin at 17, which wasn't, and a receipt suggesting that Obamacare would tax non-medical items like clothes and rifles. It was a bug in the sporting goods store's software. But the researchers also saw very old rumors resurface on the site, such as a photo of a bicycle stuck in the trunk of a tree supposedly left behind by a soldier during World War I that was supposedly to represent the cost of war. The bike was really eaten by the tree, but it was actually just left behind by a forgetful dude in the 1950s. The site is crowdsourcing the truth. It will identify bad posts in two ways by reports from users flagging the link as a fake news story, but also by taking into account when many people choose to delete posts. The finger has long been pointed at the Internet for facilitating the spread of hoaxes and lies. <laughs> Maybe they should look at the, uh, the media for, for that type of thing as well. Hello, false flags. Hello, Sandy Hook. Hello, Paris false flag event. Uh... As a huge platform for the social distribution of news and information, Facebook's move could significantly deter the spread of false information. The label it's adding to posts is something people have long called for on Twitter, so that tweets containing false information would be flagged to help stop the spread of untruths. Twitter has not yet added such a feature. At the end of the day, the Facebook's system still relies on human beings to realize information is false and to delete stories that they learn are wrong. So it's only as good as Facebook's users are at detecting BS. Plus, it only applies to links to outside sites. You can't use this to report your conservative uncle for a political diatribe with incorrect facts unless he links to an outside source. Now, that's what they claim. We know for a fact, and, and it has been proven quite a few times, that Facebook does actively delete posts. Facebook actively censors information and news stories, whether they are false or true, especially in relation to anything in the alternative field or in the, the fringy side of things. They, they actively hunt down information that people are spreading and delete it. Yeah, you see it all the time with things like medical marijuana facts and uh, facts about Monsanto and all of that stuff. It, it really, they're real active with it. It's been proven multiple times. So with this type of thing going on, this is not really a, a new thing even though they claim that it is. The only newness to this is that they're going to add a, a feature basically to allow users themselves to also add to the flagging information that this post is a, a false or a fake post or whatever. I could see this being very misused, especially when it comes to the sock puppets and the propaganda that goes on. Uh, again, I'll refer you to a show that I did previously uh, uh, about propaganda that was last week. People will create multiple social platform or uh, uh, profiles on these different platforms, and they seem realistic. In fact, uh, I spoke about uh, an application or an app that you can buy for your your phone or your tablet that will create an entire social profile for you that fakes as if you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And it appears real up to and including having voicemail uh, for this fake person. <laughs> so social profiles are easy to create. It's as easy as getting an email address, which is, uh, well, cake. It is a cakewalk to get an email address. It doesn't take that much, okay? 
I'll give you an example. I, I have my website, openeyesnetwork.com, and under that website, I could literally create unlimited email accounts with the blank at openeyesnetwork.com. It's as simple as that. You could create 40, 50, 100, 500, 5,000 email profiles if you so desire and use each of those to create a new account on Facebook. And it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And then if you go to a news feed and you see an article that, for instance, Smack Talks uh, uh, Monsanto and this person has been hired by Monsanto to hunt down, seek out and destroy any posts that are uh, uh, Smack Talking Monsanto. And then they use their 50 or 100 um, social profiles or sock puppet profiles on Facebook to flag this article or to flag this photo or to flag this post as being fake, well, suddenly the social norm, the, the social bias that works in people, they're going to see this post and say, oh, well, this must be fake because, well, look here, my, my fellow human beings said that this is false information. You see, it's as simple as that. So guys, when, when it comes to this, listen, I, I'm bringing this up because you're going to see this happen. You're going to see this happen on, I know a lot of you guys hang out on Facebook. I know you do. You're going to see this occur. Start looking at your newsfeed and you're going to see all of these different stories that, that talk about natural cures that talk about, um, cures to cancer that talk about Monsanto that talk about the EPA or the FDA or vaccines and on and on and on all of this stuff. It's going to be hit with this new feature. And it's not only going to be flagging these things and showing above the story. This story is containing false information. According to your fellow users, it's not only going to do that, but if enough of them go and flag it, it automatically deletes the the file. It automatically deletes the post. I can see a lot of misuse coming around because of this in particular. And I'm just giving you guys the, the fair warning. This is fair warning with it. <laughs> I ran across another one that, that talked about... Um, Unmanned drones and ways that they will be impacting farmers in the future and how it's going to impact the agricultural business in the future. And uh, one of the one of the things that, that I saw in this article and now all of these articles, guys, as, as always, they're going to be linked up on the show notes to this show. But one of the things that I ran across in this article talked about how um, the different drones are going to be used to help spread pesticides. It's going to be used to uh, search out missing cows and on and on and on. Well, in the article, they also said um, drone technology already used in other countries can make farmers more efficient by helping them locate problem spots in vast fields of or ranch lands. Increasing efficiency, meaning lower costs for consumers and less impact on the environment if farmers used fewer chemicals because drones showed them exactly where to spray. There are downsides for farmers, and this is, this is the part that kind of bothered me here. There are downsides for farmers. Documentary filmmaker Mark DeVries has used an unmanned drone vehicle to fly over large commercial hog operations and film them. He wants consumers to see the buildings full of animals and huge manure pits. The drones allow for close-ups and vantage points that satellites and airplanes cannot easily obtain. RJ Carney of the American Farm Bureau Federation says there is a major concern about these kinds of films and his group intends to work with the Obama administration and Congress to address it. He says such films are not only a privacy violation, but can put farmers at a competitive disadvantage. So instead of fixing the problems and I saw this, this film that this guy made and, and you want to talk about absolutely disgusting. I never knew about this and I, I recommend you guys take a look at this, this video that he made. It's, it's only a couple of minutes long, but it shows him flying the drone and recording 
but him flying the drone over hog farm operations and the uh, the pigs being kept in in real small itty bitty teeny tiny spaces and all of them are piled up together and um, in horrible conditions and then these huge huge pits of just crap it, it literally pig crap and I mean just with they were they were like two three football fields in size and it's just nothing but a big huge 20 30 foot deep pit of of hog crap so instead of trying to figure out a way to handle the problem or handle the the environmental impact that this kind of operation uh does no the problem is the fact that the guy filmed it you see, that that's how it goes. That that's how these kinds of things work. They're not concerned about the the problem of the operation. They're they're concerned with the fact that the operation was seen and noticed. It's a little ridiculous. Justice Department uh, spies millions of cars, according to the Wall Street Journal. The Justice Department has secretly been gathering and storing hundreds of millions of records about motorists in an effort to build a national database that tracks the movement of vehicles across the country. The newspaper said the main aim of the license plate tracking program run by the Drug Enforcement Administration was to seize automobiles, money, and other assets to fight drug trafficking, according to one government document. But the use of the database had expanded to include hunting for vehicles linked to other possible crimes, including kidnapping, killings, and rape suspects, and citing current and former officials and government documents to say so. Now, listen, we have been saying for for a long time now that these kinds of databases exist, that they do spy on everything that goes on, that we that that they do track everything that goes on. And right here is documented proof once again that we're right and that the people who say, oh, well, you guys are full of crap. You guys are lying. They they wouldn't do that. They don't spy on people, blah, blah, blah. Listen, they do. We've been proving it over and over again. When are you going to people, when are you people going to wake up and actually listen? The, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The American public, the, the, the masses of the American public, and this isn't even just American problem, worldwide, the masses of the public are aggressively ignorant. And it's all about mass consumerism and, and getting whatever it is that they're going to get at that moment. They don't care about anything else. It's aggressive ignorance. You guys have had this stuff pointed out over and over. It, you know, when when it when it came to the when it came to the the idea that the NSA was was recording phone calls and l- looking at emails and on and on and on, and people said over and over again, "You guys are lying. You're full of crap. They don't do that. There's no way they can do that." And then they admitted that they're doing it. Then you guys say, oh, well, we knew that all along. (laughs) And by you guys, I mean the masses of the public. I'm not meaning you guys, my specific listeners. I know you guys know better. But you get the idea. The the masses, the the great unwashed out there, they're all about just just taking care of themselves and nothing else. And and whatever happens, happens. It's just. It drives us crazy. It drives me crazy because I I spend a lot of time trying to point these kinds of things out to people. And I get told time and time again, you're full of crap, Ira. You don't know what you're talking about, man. They wouldn't do this kind of stuff. Lo and behold, yet again, proven right. Maybe someday people will learn. As a medical researcher at Harvard, Mark Schreim gets a very special kind of spam in his inbox every day. He receives at least one request from an open access medical journal promising to publish his research if he pays $500. Schreim is worried that there might be uh, bigger issues at stake. 
What exactly are these journals publishing and who is taking these journals to be credible sources of information? Sharm decided to see how easy it would be to publish an article. So he made one up like he literally made one up. He did it using www.randomtextgenerator.com. The article entitled Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and its authors are the venerable Pinkerton A. LeBrain and Orson Wells. The subtitle reads The Surgical and Neoplastic Role of Cacao Extract in Breakfast Cereals. Shrime submitted it to 37 journals over two weeks of time, and so far, 17 of them have accepted it. <laughs> Several have already typeset it and give him, given him reviews. And one publication says that his methods are novel and innovative. But when Shrine looked up the physical locations of these publications, he discovered that many had very suspicious addresses. One was actually inside of a strip club. <laughs> so I, I brought this article up because experts out there. A lot of people claim to be experts and they will say, Oh, well, see, I've been published in this journal and this publication and this journal and this publication. And see, I have a, I have a white lab coat on and I have letters behind my name. You need to listen to what I'm saying because I'm telling you the truth and I know what I'm talking about. And here you see, <laughs> It very well could be that the publication was coming out of a strip club and is a complete sham, a complete fake. You just never know. That's the way that these things go, guys. It really is. It's, it's, um, it's, it, the journal publishing business, especially in the medical field, has become big business. They make a killing at it. They really do. Lots of money is involved in it. Like I said, I mean, in this article right here, pay $500, you can get your, your article published in the journal. In this wonderfully prestigious journal. Take advantage of it today. You can become an expert too, guys. Write, a, write an article about how you're, you're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and <laughs> you too can become an expert. Well, listen, guys, I am going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to start getting into some of the, the consciousness subjects. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation because it's a big one for me. I really enjoy talking about it. And, and hopefully, it'll be a wonderful learning experience for both of us. So stick around with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. You may be suffering from OMS, Open Mind Syndrome. This disorder can be a burden on those suffering from it, as they see the insanity in the world around them. Symptoms of this disorder are likely to be not accepting the status quo, talking frequently about issues that are really important, studying things that are not acceptable by the mainstream thinking, and asking too many questions. This disease can spread rapidly, even over the internet and airwaves. It is becoming an epidemic. If you or someone you know suffers from open mind syndrome, do not seek help. It is apparent that this condition is actually the normal human response to information. In fact, it is best to interact often with fellow sufferers at latenightinthemidlands.com to remain open-minded. Open Mind Syndrome. It's no joke. The LNM Radio Network and Late Night in the Midlands depends on you, the listener. Without you, there would be no us. So help us continue to bring you the best guests with the best information and subscribe today. Information on becoming an LNM subscriber can be found at the top of LateNightInTheMidlands.com. Just click the About Subscriptions tab and become part of the family while helping the truth stay alive. 
And while you're at it, maybe subscriptions aren't for you. A one-time donation helps as well. Click that Donate button on the right side of LateNightInTheMidlands.com and help us help you. There are days that the red pill is bitter in my stomach, but I can't get it back out. I think because I have to. I speak because I have no choice. I walk through this dark age we're in with open eyes. Listen to Open Eyes on LateNightInTheMidlands.com And together, maybe we won't stumble and fall. We have a lot of things going on in America right now, for instance, that is very dark and very unfocused. And because of that darkness that's surrounding everybody and because of that unfocusedness, people are easily manipulated and they're easily steered into becoming something that they originally never intended to be and what we as human beings were never originally intended to be. We as human beings are extremely bright, creative forces in the universe. We have so many things trying to hold us down and trying to hold us back from entering into this new place in the universe that's waiting for us. At any moment, we could step forward and say, enough is enough with all of the the crap that you're spewing out at us. We want to be human beings. We don't want to be your slaves anymore. We don't want to be held down anymore. We don't want your darkness covering us anymore. We are going to unite against you, the dark masters that are pulling these strings to make us believe that our children are something that they're not, into believing that our children are animals, into believing that our children are things that should be controlled and should be held down and held back and dumbed down and refused answers to the questions that they have in their minds to suppress their creativity, to suppress who they really are, to suppress the love that they have for everyone and everything around them and to make them hate and to breed passion in them to go against other people, to raise up arms against other people and go across the seas and start blowing people away just because they're different, just because they're brown, just because they're red, just because they're yellow, just because they're different than who they are, even though there is no difference between any of us other than the culture that we live in and the tenets that we follow. And those things are taught to us. They're not who we are. They're not what we originally were. They're not what we were born to be. They are taught to us. They are driven into our brains. They are forced onto us as a template that they want us to follow, that they want us to be, to not have control over ourselves and follow the party line that they lay out for us, to follow the path that they want us to follow and to no longer realize that we don't need them to govern us us, that we don't need them to control us. We are amazing beings. We are beautiful creations that come from a core of love. We are energy. We are all that there is. We are the consciousness that creates what we see. And because we have been manipulated, because we have been taught to think differently, taught to think that, oh, life doesn't actually matter. Oh, there are 
no things out there. There's nothing else out there other than us here on Earth. There's nothing else out there. That's a laughable proposition. How can you even think that? Oh, look at that other person over there. They're different than you are. You should hate them. Oh, look at that person over there. They think differently than you do. We should hate them. These are the lies that are destroying us right now. These are the lies that are destroying us. They really are. Hello again. Welcome back to Open Eyes. My name is Ira Robinson, and I want to thank you guys for sticking around through that break. You know, we're lied to on a constant basis about who we are, what we are, what we stand for, what we should stand for, what life means, what life is, what our children are. We're lied to. Lies, lies, lies. It's all manipulation. It's all propaganda. We are from the the moment that we are conceived, we are in this world of smoke and mirrors. We are in this world of fakeness and lies. And hopefully through my actions, through the actions of the other hosts here on late night in the midlands.com, for instance, hopefully a little bit of the truth can filter through the lies that are told in the rest of the media world. You know, I talked earlier in the, the news section about the experts publishing articles on these different journals and that they get away with these articles because they just pay a little bit of a fee to get published in them. And although they may be disreputable, the masses don't know that we don't, we don't know the difference between one journal and another. For instance, we don't know the difference between somebody talking out their butt about something and somebody who's actually being truthful. We don't know because it's all hidden from us. We don't know because it's all done through this filter of propaganda. And when I was speaking about that article earlier, one of the things that that struck me as well is the idea that a lot of these, a lot of these um, companies and corporations that put out studies, for instance, saying, "Oh, well, GMO foods are safe." Oh, well, high fructose corn syrup is, is no problem. Here's, here's a, a study that we did to show why. And they get these things published. And then they can point to that publication and say, see, we got published in this journal. It must be true. And yet this guy gets away with, with publishing in all of these journals. I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And it was literally just nothing but random text that was generated off of a website. That's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. That's the kind of lies that we're dealing with. These, I mean, these, these companies, they'll go to advertising agencies and tell them, Hey, we want you guys to give us a great public relations expose, make us as, as popular as you can get us, make us seem as, as, um, as good as we can get. And there are over 7,000 different public relations firms just here in the United States alone. It's a multi-billion dollar industry every year. These companies pay good money to do this. And so these public relations firms, they will go to one of these journals and they'll publish something on one of these journals for their expert that they hire and it's all a lie. It's all false, but lo and behold, it's used as an example of this is truthfulness. This, we, we have this article published here and <clears throat> we, we are expert on this subject. That's how it goes guys. 
And it's all a lie. It's all smoke and mirrors. It is Hollywood. It is a Hollywood production. And that's how they get away with it. I just wanted to be sure to touch on that subject because this is this is something that we're facing every day. Every minute of every day, we're facing these lies. We're facing this stuff. And it's important to be able to, to discern, to have discernment on what is true and what is not. And in general, anything you see on television, that's a lie. <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you that right now. Almost everything, and in fact, I would even go so far as to say 99.9% .9 of everything that you see on the television screen is nothing but a scripted lie. The media plays you. The, the anchor man that you see at the desk, he's not a journalist. He's an actor reading from a script. Simple as that. Simple as that. So, guys, I wanted to touch into consciousness. <laughs> so consciousness is, is a really important subject, and it's actually a really important subject when it comes to these, these things that I'm actually talking about here. Because it is our consciousnesses that are being manipulated with all of these different lies, with all of these different things. When you, for example, hear propaganda, when you hear these things, like I was just talking about the, the expert coming onto the screen and saying, well, you know, I've been published in journal, 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 journal. I've got these letters and numbers behind my name. Then you as as the the average person have now been programmed to respond to this person in a in a certain uh pre-programmed way they expect that that a, a certain percentage of the population is going to respond to this expert on the screen in a favor favorable way because one type of propaganda is called authoritative propaganda. They, they bring a person who is a supposed symbol of authority and anything that he says is taken by the average person as that authority information. So it's believed it's, it's, uh, it's filtered with a certain bias towards the positive. That's how our consciousnesses work. That's, that's how the, well, it's how the, the, the meat suit works. It's not necessarily how the consciousness works, but the consciousness is, uh, it's, it's impacted by the filters that are on us. So, one thing that I ran across as well, I didn't get to this in the news segment, but I, I wanted to be sure to get to it here because this actually deals directly with consciousness as well. So before I get into actual deeper consciousness topics, I wanted to be sure to talk about this because this is something that, that uh, well, this, this could have a pretty big impact on us as humanity in the future and, and maybe not even all that far off at that. So the, the article that I ran across talks about the, the 1000 year sentence in prison and how this type of thing would be possible. And the, uh, the article says future biotechnology could be used to trick a prisoner's mind into thinking that they have served a 1000 year sentence. Uh, a philosopher named Rebecca Roach is in charge of a team of scholars which are focused on the ways to develop technologies that would transform punishment. Dr. Roach says that the prison sentence of serious criminals could be made worse by extending their lives. Uh, a quote from her says, there are a number of psychoactive drugs that distort people's sense of time. So you could imagine developing a pill or a liquid that made someone feel like they were serving a 1000 year sentence. If the speed up were a factor of a million, a millennium of thinking would be accomplished in eight and a half hours, uploading the mind of a convicted criminal and running it a million times faster than normal would enable the uploaded criminal to serve a 1000 year sentence in eight and a half hours. This would obviously be much cheaper for the taxpayer than extending criminals lifespans to enable them to serve 
1,000 years in real time. So the the question that I have regarding this, and only one question would be, is it is it right to take this kind of a path? Is this the right way to go with things? I mean, to me, to me, this is psychological torture and any sane person would be against it. Um, prison is, is supposed to accomplish basically two things, uh, protect society from dangerous criminals and also to re rehabilitate the people so that they can be reintegrated into society. Now, whether that works right now or not, it's sort of neither here nor there. I mean, it does work for the most part, but there are some that are hardened criminals that may not ever change their ways. But this type of thing doesn't do either one of those. <laughs> and in fact, it, it, it to me is pretty counterproductive. I mean, what, what is the, the point of having a person serve a thousand years worth of time in eight hours just to release them broken, you know, this, this broken human being back into society. I mean, are they trying to encourage inmates to, to break with reality completely and to start going on a rampage once they're released? <laughs> If if someone did something so bad that you think that they deserve a 1,000 year sentence, then you need to get the cojones together to, to just end their lives, to just execute them and get it over with instead of torturing someone for a thousand years worth of time. I mean, does that make sense? If someone did something bad enough that it would require a thousand years worth of time to rehabilitate them or that they need to be punished for a thousand years, you may as well just kill them. You may as well just execute them and get it over with. But the problem is that a lot of people think, oh, well, we can't do that. We can't execute criminals and, and on and on and on. So they, they think this is an appropriate reaction. I mean, imagine if someone burned you with a cigarette or something or, or uh, I don't know, cut you just before you get injected with this kind of a drug. What, what kind of thing is going to end up happening with that? Then, then you're going to be feeling that pain for a thousand years. I mean, that's... That that's that's a pretty sick thought, really. I wonder how many of these drugs have already been developed by the CIA for for use in in things like MK Ultra. I mean, maybe that's how this type of thing goes on, right? They 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 inject them with something, and and now they're extended out for a thousand years, and well, they got a thousand years worth of time to manipulate somebody's brain, and and. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, how many of these things have already been developed and are currently in use? I mean, yeah, this concept has been kicked around a lot in science fiction and fantasy. The idea of extending out criminals or, or prisoners lifespan somehow or, or to extend it out in their brain, for instance. But. To, to actually do it in real life, that that's beyond me. That that's just that goes beyond anything that I can really accept. I, I don't I don't care for the idea at all. Now, if you were to let's say use this kind of a drug to um further an education type of agenda, what what uh what type of things would have happened, let's say, for example, if Albert Einstein were to be able to have a thousand years worth of thinking on hand 
You know, what, what kind of progress would we have made at this point? But you see, they're, they're not talking about that. They're talking about how to use this on prisoners, how to use this to torture people. You see, they're not using it to, oh, well, let's, let's see what good things can come from this. <laughs> now it's all, it's all crazy. It's all bad, you know? <laughs> I mean, like I said, the uh, they even mentioned hooking the prisoner up to a computer to have them see what they want them to see. It's crazy. It really is. Talk about really breaking somebody's consciousness. That that would mine. It really would. So let's talk a little bit about consciousness, shall we? Consciousness, that's the the thing that makes we, we. <laughs> Science tries to claim that it understands consciousness. They, they, they come forward and say, well, consciousness is a product of the processes of the brain. And that we're all nothing more than the sum of our parts. And it's, it's, they, they basically say it's, it's a, it's an extension of the processes the brain has as it sees and it hears and it feels everything in the world around us. But the question is, can they point to a spot in the brain that is the center of consciousness? Can they measure it or weigh it? or point definitively at it and say, there it is. Well, no, they can't. I mean, all of reality hinges on our conscious perceptions of it. And yet science has no explanation as to what consciousness is, let alone where it comes from. Let, let's um, let's do a little experiment here. Take five seconds of time to think about what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Okay, so did you do that? You just did something that no other organism on Earth or even in the universe as we know it you know, that, that we know of can do. Um, we've predicted an alternative future for ourselves, an alternative universe or, or reality for ourselves that we can then lead ourselves to. So for instance, the way things stand right now, you are sitting there at your desk or you're, walking on the treadmill or you're sitting in your car or wherever it is that you might be right now. Yeah. Take a look around at yourself right now. This is, this is the, the crux of your reality. This is the moment that you're in. There's no future. There's no past. It's just right now. So the future doesn't exist until you get there. It doesn't exist until you enter it and have done whatever it is. And then that, future becomes the past. Okay. Well, let's say for example, you just imagined that you're going to go to the grocery store tomorrow and buy some hamburger. That's an alternative future from the one that you've got right now. And you can lead yourself forward from now until that point in time to fulfill that future. You see, that's, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a pretty powerful thing because as far as we know it, no other beings here on this planet can do that. No other beings on this planet can conceive of what it's going to be doing at a future date to be able to then push itself forward to accomplish that goal. Now let's take 10 seconds 
And I want you to take this 10 seconds and not think about anything at all. Are you ready? Go. Did you do it? And were you able to, to get through that 10 seconds without thinking of anything at all? I can't make it past three seconds. <laughs> Now, maybe if you're really good at meditation and you were in a meditative state at that point, maybe then you could have done it. But but personally, I couldn't make it past three seconds. Uh, I've got something always going on in my mind, and maybe that's my own problem. But <laughs> but I, I would say that probably you didn't make it past that 10, point, that 10 seconds either. You probably didn't make it through that. 10 seconds without thinking of something, even if it was just, wow, this is a really long, empty silence. <laughs> but that means that although we have the most powerful tool inside of our heads, we can't turn it off. We can't stop thinking. We can't stop being conscious of things. There's always something actively going on around us and, and in our heads. We are, we are right now, essentially, despite all of our technology and all of our knowledge, living in the dark ages. We're all in the dark about who we are, what we are, and what it really means to be human. What it means to be alive and in this world right now at this moment. But you see, everything, everything is energy. Everything is connected through the energy that's surrounding us, flowing through us, connecting us not only to each other, but to the entirety of existence. You, you think that your five senses tell you that your world is solid. But what you think is solid is just vibrating at a range that your senses can be aware of or can perceive as being real. But that's not what is real. That's not even close to the depths of what is really real. <laughs> I mean, think about it this way. When you see something, the visual input of the frequencies and the vibrations are entering your pupils and are then going to the back of your brain where it displays on the, the displays the image on a screen there in the back of your head that screen that dark theater inside of your mind is where the the vision is processed. But is that really real? There, there are a lot of, of, I guess you could say scientific things that have been put forward and a lot of, a lot of things to show that no, that isn't actually what is real. That what is real is far beyond what we perceive. I mean, you think that you have five senses, but you don't, you actually have more than 20. They just don't talk about the, the ones beyond sight, uh, taste, hearing, touch, you know, the, and smell. They, they don't talk about any beyond those, but we do have more senses than just those. So what is real isn't even what you perceive it to be. There's, there's a lot more that goes into the processing of what we sense. Okay. There have been experiments done that show that what we think happens in life is not actually true. It's just 
well, it's, it's a lie, but it's a lie that we have trained ourselves to believe. So for example, a, uh, an experiment that was done, uh, a surgeon during a brain operation placed sensors on the, uh, the pain receptor areas or the pain response areas of the brain. These, um, these sensors would send signals to a computer that would then record the output of the brain being worked on to show when down to the millisecond, when the brain responded to a stimuli. So without the patient being able to see, they would take needles and they would apply them to different areas of the body to see how long it would take for the brain to respond to painful stimuli. Well, what they found was that the brain actually started to respond to the pain before the needles were inserted. I mean, it literally predicted when the pain would be happening moments before it actually happened. So the, the pain receptors of the brain would begin to fire and trigger before any needle even came close to the, the body of the person. It was getting ready to feel the pain, but there was no actual pain that was going on to make it happen. So the brain was literally predicting the future at that point. The brain was literally predicting the future of this pain occurring in this certain area of the body. It knew what was going to happen and it prepared itself to respond to the pain. You see, this is, this is where the, the weirdness gets into all of this. But the, if, if, if you were to, to hear about this stuff, people would call it paranormal, right? People would call it, well, this is, this is not what we normally think of happening. So this is getting into the woo woo weirdness, right? <laughs> so in another experiment, people were tested to see how and why they would respond to certain visual stimuli. So they did this funnily enough with pornographic images. They tested quite a few people with this one, actually, and they, they found the same results nearly every time that they did the experiment. What they would do is put different images on a screen in front of people while they were attached to center uh, or sensors, which like test the, the galvanic skin response and the... Um, heart rate and, and that sort of thing. And what they found was that people would start acting in a stimulated response way before a pornographic picture was shown on the screen, while any other type of picture they wouldn't have any response to basically at all. So they would again respond to the, the images before the images were actually seen. Now, these two experiments alone point to some sort of extrasensory perception, whether they are responding somehow to a future seen event, or if they were reading the mind of the researchers before the pictures were shown, or whatever, one way or the other, they were acting in a way that is outside of the normal. So in other words, a paranormal sort of way, but still something was there and something interacted with the consciousness of the people in order to have this type of thing happen, right? And we see this kind of stuff a lot. I mean, there are a large number of experiments out there that you can go take a look at and see that, that what we understand as happening to us is not actually 
how things work. You see, folks, this is why I find this kind of stuff just just endlessly fascinating. I mean, to me, this is um, this is showing how we are not what we think we are. This is showing how we are something different than what we perceive ourselves to be. We see ourselves in these meat suits that we're wearing. But that's not the end all and be all of what we are. There is so much more to us than what we think we are. And yet we're lied to all the time about all of this. We're told over and over and over again, oh, well, no, there's no such thing as predicting the future. There's no such thing as as extrasensory perception. And yet these experiments right here show that that's exactly how things are. They know for a fact that and listen guys this is a fact they know for a fact that when we do things we have decided to do them seconds before we actually go through with the action and yet oh well none of that stuff is real <laughs> In experiment after experiment, it has been proven true. The only reason why you have not heard about it, maybe, or why the general population has not heard about it, is because this stuff would throw off the status quo, and they would lose their foothold on the great masses of humanity. They would lose their foothold on us. Because once they put forward the idea that we're more than what we perceive ourselves to be, suddenly we will start actually asking questions and saying, oh, really? Is that the case? Okay, so then what are we really? What are we? Oh, well, we don't know that. Oh, well, maybe we did come from Mars. Maybe we were originally there. Maybe there has been more to civilizations across the planet before this one. Maybe there has been. You see... All of that stuff opens doors, and they want the doors to remain shut. So even though these experiments have been done by them themselves, they don't put the information out to the great masses of humanity. No, they don't want that. They'll talk about it maybe themselves or amongst themselves, but they don't want this stuff actually getting out much into the public. It would defeat their purpose, you see. Uh, it's how it goes. And, and, you know, personally, I'm tired of the lies. I, I would rather know the truth about everything. I don't care what the truth is. I just want to know the truth. I kind of, I kind of ascribe to, uh, Michael Vera from late night in the Midland. He, he kind of says the same thing and I have to fully agree with it. It's, it's the truth. I don't care what the truth is. I just want to know it. And I would, Love for us as human beings to come together and stop being so divided over every little thing that we're told we need to be divided about. Stop doing all of that and come together and figure out who we are or what we are or what we're about. But they don't want that to happen because their their power would end in a heartbeat. They don't want that. That would be horrible for them. So I wanted to talk about a couple of, of uh, concepts that happen with regards to consciousness that are problems with consciousness and how these things actually point to the fact that, that there is something regarding consciousness that science doesn't have an explanation for, that science doesn't have a, a – a thing that they can point to and say in the brain, here's the problem. You see <laughs> these, um, these consciousness issues actually are, are proof in the pudding that consciousness is not what they claim it is. You know, that it's a, a product of the processes of the brain. So there's a, there, there's a disorder that's called, um, let me see if I can pronounce this right. It's an osignosia. A uh, example of anosognosia is a patient that has lost the ability to raise their right hand. 
when asked to raise their hand, uh, the, like their left hand, they'll raise it. No problem. But when they're asked to raise the right one, they will do nothing. And when they're asked why they didn't raise it, they'll give some excuse as to why they didn't. So they'll say something like, oh, well, I didn't feel like it. Or, well, there was a, there was a fly on the wall over there and I didn't want to disturb it by moving my arm and maybe having it land on my arm. So that's why I didn't move it. These, uh, these patients, they, they, they will make any excuse that they can to not move the body part that they're suffering, suffering this agnostic. See, I pronounced it correctly before the anosognosia with, they will do everything that they can to deny that they are suffering from this. And according to experiments that are done with all of it, the, the brain, the, their consciousness or, or well, their, their brain, it almost doesn't even have the, the part there to be able to raise the right arm, but the consciousness is, is making an excuse for it. So another one is, um, it's called Anton Babinski syndrome. The patients with Anton Babinski syndrome are cortically blind, but they deny being blind. They will do everything that they can do to claim that they're just fine. The thing with the Anton Babinski syndrome sufferers is that there's some disconnect between what they're experiencing and what is actually happening in the mind. The dramatic part of this disorder is that they don't know that they can't see. The part of their brain that monitors visual input is not telling the rest of the brain anything. It isn't even aware that there is no visual input. This means that the rest of the brain has to make every excuse to compensate for the lack of vision. So, for example, they will walk through a room that they've never walked through before, for instance, and bump into a table. And when asked, well, why did you bump into the table? Didn't you see it? And they say, yes, I saw it, but the, there was something else on the floor over here beside me. And I, and I was trying to step around it. And, and so I bumped into the table, you see, or they'll say, oh, well, no, I was looking up at the time and I didn't see the table sitting there. Their, their brain says, I can, I can't see, but the, the part of the brain that interacts with the consciousness, it, it, it treats it completely differently. You see? So what part of us is us? Let, let's, let's put forward this question. What part of us is us? If a person were to replace every single cell from me and replaced it with yours, what point is reached where I become you and you become me? Is the consciousness transferred between the two people? This is, this is the type of question that, that makes it that, that points out that consciousness, what, where, where does the consciousness end and, and the, the meat suit begins, you see, and I'm going to touch into this stuff actually, because we have to take a break here. <laughs> I just realized the time, uh, we're going to take a break here real quick. And when we come back, actually, we're going to go ahead and touch into that that topic. We're going to talk about dreams. We're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about spirits and, and go much more into the, the, the more woo woo kind of aspects of it all. <laughs> so, um, hang out with us. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes after these messages.
The Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network is deeply devoted to you, the listener. We feel it is necessary to bring you all of the information that you can use in your life. Each and every day, you will find something to listen to here. And whether you come away from the shows informed, inspired, or entertained, it is our passion. We don't bow to corporations, and we don't have handlers to tell us what not to talk about. We bring you everything. Late Night in the Midlands, however, is fully listener-supported. We need your help to stay on the air and to make sure that we get the bills paid. We need your help to keep the truth alive. If you feel that you have gotten anything out of Late Night in the Midlands, we would appreciate your support. You can become a subscriber and help us out on a monthly basis, or if you'd like, a one-time donation is fully appreciated as well. Every year, the average household in America spends over $3,000 on entertainment alone. If you could help us with just a tiny fraction of that amount, you would make all of the difference. Go to LateNightInTheMidlands.com and click on the subscribe button. Thank you, and as always, keep yourself informed. Open Eyes is dedicated to finding the truth in all matters. We are not afraid to be politically incorrect or to ask questions. Whether it is the paranormal, government cover-ups, the dark agenda that the puppet masters have in store for us, or aliens and UFOs, nothing remains hidden. Listen to Open Eyes, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on LateNightInTheMidlands.com or OpenEyesNetwork.com. Open hearts, open minds, open eyes.
little bit of Ivan Torrent there, uh, Human Legacy. I thought that song was going to be appropriate for tonight. That's one of my favorite songs, actually. That song always gets me all fired up and ready to go, man. I, I love, love music like that. Just so inspiring, so epic. I, I love it. <laughs> thought I had to bring that to you. Hello again. My name is Ira, and you're listening to Open Eyes. We've been talking about consciousness and, and the way that it may interact with the paranormal. And the the things that, well, that have been hidden from us in regards to the the consciousness issue, and hopefully I've brought forward some some deep thoughts to you guys so far with all of this, and and the way that maybe you think about who you are and what you are and how you relate to the world around you. I wanted to get into the topic of dreams because dreams are really important when it comes to the consciousness issue and the paranormal as well. Uh, a lot of people have dreams that are future predictive and they do come true. A lot of people have dreams that are very interactive, very um, telling as far as situations that are going on around them go, you know, people talk about visions and that sort of thing. It's all about dreams and dreams have a, a deep impact on our consciousness. So when we dream, where are we? <laughs> you know, it's incredibly bizarre. If you really think about it, we're alive walking in bodies during the day. We have thoughts and we have feelings and, and talk to people the the things that are important to us, there's something above something below, you know, the sky's up there and the land's down below. And, <laughs> you know, I know I'm on this planet earth orbiting around this galactic center and so on and so forth. But when I dream I'm inside of myself. I'm inside of my own personal bubble, my own reality inside the things which happen in the dream really do happen. <laughs> the, um, science has found that, that when you dream, for instance, and you're dreaming about a, let's say a specific thing or object or whatever, they've been able to find that the portions of the brain, which interact with, with certain, um, symbols or, or characteristics light up for the dream as well as when it's seen in reality. And even when you just think about an object, for instance, when you think about a, an apple and you see an apple, the two things, although separate, interact in the brain in the exact same way. So when you think about an apple, you are literally creating the apple inside of yourself inside of your consciousness. It's, um, it's kind of amazing to me <laughs> when I think about it, how these different things happen. I mean, we know for instance, okay, that, that you can kill a person by destroying portions of the brain, like in the, the periaqueductal gray, which is, the upper part of the brain stem. If you were to surgically destroy that part of the brain, which would kill a person, by the way, <laughs> um, then you'd lose the part of the brain that creates the chemicals, which initiate the awakefulness. For example, children that are born with uh, anencephaly, I think that's how it's pronounced. They, they don't have a, a cortex under an MRI. You, you see a, an empty skull basically when, when you look inside, they, they have a brain stem, but there's no actual brain 
there. But the so so they should be not there. They they should be essentially not conscious of anything. Correct? Because there's no brain there for them to have any interaction with the outside world. And yet they do respond to the outside world. They will laugh when other people are laughing around them. They'll smile uh, at, at different tactile sensations and that sort of thing. So, and and uh, they'll they'll be afraid. They'll have a, a fear response when loud noises or or predatory no- noises and that sort of thing happen. And so they have a they have an intact sensory matrix or paraaquatal duct gr- uh, gray, but they're they're conscious in that section of things. You see. We don't understand how the consciousness is something that's outside of ourselves. You see, the consciousness, the consciousness is, is outside of the brain. It's, it's above or, or around it, for instance, but it's not actually inside of the brain. It's sort of like the control system that, that is, uh, you like a video game, you know, the, the controller, <laughs> it's the, the person who's holding the controller and the, the brain is the controller. The body is the actual video game that's being played. So, uh, I have a, I have another thought experiment for you guys here real quick. Let's say that you were to take some kind of hallucinatory drug this this will hopefully um, elaborate on what I'm talking about here. So let's say that you take a, a, a hallucinogen. You hallucinate like a, a little pink elephant on the floor in front of you, <laughs> but you know that it's a hallucination. So suddenly it, it grows huge. It, it gets big. And the walls go away. And suddenly you find yourself on a, an African savanna and your skin turns black and you touch your face and you realize that you're, you're not yourself, that you're somebody else. So the person that you have become while you are in that state is actually who you are. Your body is maybe the same, but your consciousness is something completely different and you will act and interact with the world around you as if that was what reality is. The consciousness can become, can, can change the reality that you see around you. But the, the fact is that, that the, your brain for instance, will respond exactly as if this reality is real. I mean, most of the time we're looking at our lives like it's like it's a little eight by 10 picture. We can't see around it or past it. And we can't really come to grips with the fact that everything around us is outside of ourselves and that we ourselves are outside of ourselves also. You know, it's like um I, I've said a few times over over the time period that I've been doing my show here that the person that you are is not actually who you think you are. You're you're an actor playing a part on a stage. But just like an actor takes on a role and you watch them in the movie that actor is playing the part, but that actor is not the part. This it's the same with us. We are, we, we interact with everything and we, we are acting as if, and see, we're acting as if we are part of this world and part of what we're seeing around us. But the consciousness, our, our consciousness is, is the actor that's playing the part. We're not the role, we're the actor. 
that that's where you can start to really understand the world around you. If you can look at it in that light, you'll start to see the, the difficult things falling away a little bit. Now, as far as, um, as far as the, the paranormal things are, are concerned, I think a lot of, a lot of what we see going on around us is, is the fact that, well, we're all energy, right? I spoke about that earlier and the, the way that we interact with it is through the electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic field is something really, I mean, potent. It's, it's, it's huge. It's all around us. We're, we're constantly surrounded by this, this field. In fact, it's, um, it's so thick at this point, for example, with all of the different, um, signals that are sent out, the Wi-Fi signals, the, the, um, it's, it's so dense with all the communications bandwidth in the atmosphere that they don't even really use radar anymore. They, or, or they don't have to, they, uh, it, it's so dense that, that planes and that sort of thing actually create a shadow that can be picked up by devices that measure these fields, they don't really even need radar anymore. Well, we have an electromagnetic field as well. Correct. I mean, it, it's created each and every moment that we're alive. People who say that they can see auras, for example, and I would be one of them, by the way, <laughs> I think are actually just tuned somehow consciously into seeing a bit of that electromagnetic field. Now you might say that's impossible, but, or that maybe we're not even built that way, but I'd like you to consider the case of, of a, a lady named Con Conchetta Antico. I think that's how her name's pronounced. Con Conchetta. When Conchetta Antico looks at a leaf, she sees much more than just green around the edge she says, I'll see strange orange, reds, or purples in the shadows. You might see dark green, but I'll see violet, turquoise, and blue. It's like a mosaic of colors. Antigo doesn't just perceive these colors because she's an artist who paints in the Impressionist style. She's also a tetrachromat, which means that she has more receptors in her eyes to absorb color. The difference lies in Antico's cones, structures in the eyes that are calibrated to absorb particular wavelengths of light and transmit them to the brain. The average person has three cones, which enables them to see about one million colors. But Antico has four cones, so her eyes are capable of picking up dimensions and nuances of color, an estimated 100 million more than the average person can. It's shocking to me how little color people are seeing, she said. Now, in the article that I just read that from, they claim that researchers have for years said that it's impossible for something like tetra tetrachromacy to exist. And yet, here we go. <laughs> and now they say that at least 1% or more of the population is actually tetrachromatic. So why is there not then the possibility that people like me that have been able to see auras exist? I mean, the, it may be something in us is tuned slightly differently, or maybe there is an extra little something somewhere inside of our sensory perceptions that allow us to see at least a, a, a portion of the electromagnetic field. I mean, we're surrounded by things that are there that we just don't see because our perceptions don't allow us to. And yet there are other beings and other things that do see them and do interact with them. So, why preclude the idea that this type of thing has occurred with 
those of us that can do this kind of thing, you see. But science is really good at that, right? I mean, um, JBS Haldane said the four stages of acceptance in science are number one, this is worthless nonsense. Number two, this is an interesting but perverse point of view. Number three, this is true but quite unimportant. And number four, I've always said that this was true. <laughs> and this is exactly how it is, isn't it? How much of what was said to not be possible 50 years ago exists now? I mean, they've said, oh, well, there was no water on the moon. And how can you even believe something like that? You, you must be a conspiracy nut. Oh, of course there's water on the moon. I mean, we've known that all along. <laughs> I mean, it's propaganda. They, they're great players of that game. After all, they're called social scientists for a reason, right? And remember earlier the, the news article I talked about? I mean, how much scientific bunk is put out there, and yet we're supposed to accept it on blind faith. I mean, this whole thing is like that. The, the whole consciousness issue and the paranormal is all falling under that category. It's all propaganda to say, no, this stuff doesn't exist. And yet we know that it does. Any reasonable person knows that it does. They did the, they did the same thing with, with global warming. And the facade that that is, I mean, listen, in 1970, they said that we will be on, in an ice age by the year 2000. In 1976, they said that global cooling will cause a world war by the year 2000. In 1989, they said that global warming and rising sea levels will wipe out entire nations uh, off the map by the year 2000. In 1990, they said that we had five to 10 years left to save the rainforests. In 1999, they said that the Himalayan glaciers would be gone in 10 years. In the year 2000, they said snow would be a thing of the past by 2005. And hello, we just had snowmageddon. <laughs> in 2007, they said global warming would cause fewer hurricanes. In 2008, they said that the Arctic would be ice-free by 2012. And in 2012, they said that global warming would cause more hurricanes. 2007, it's going to cause less hurricanes. 2012, it's going to cause more hurricanes. And in 2014, they're screaming from the rafters that the science is settled. I mean, do you guys get it yet? They lie. They love to lie. It's either that or the scientists are the most inept people on the face of the planet. Well, aside from Congress, <laughs> but I digress. I mean, most scientists out there don't know their butts from the hole in the ground. And yet they'll claim the entire time that, that they have mastery over their fields. So what, um, how do, how do spirits fit into all of this? Well, here's my thoughts on it. The way that people look at the world is this. They think that it's that it's a matter of matter equals mind equals equals consciousness. So matter is all that there is and the mind is created out of matter and then the consciousness is created from that. But you can look at it a little differently. You can look at it as consciousness is actually all that there is and that the mind is created out of the consciousness and that then space and time and, and, and atoms and all of that kind of stuff are actually created out of the mind. And if you think about how our, our senses tell us how things are, you'll realize that that actually is a very large possibility. Now I've had a lot of dealings with spirits over the years myself, as, as many of you already know by now, but in my experience, these spirits these entities are consciousness. They're self-aware beings who try to communicate. And a lot of times they, they act and seem like they're a part of like a, a dream state. Like they're not quite awake enough to, to see or understand that they've passed on or like they're more emotional. And perhaps this is their consciousnesses upon passing through death, having imprinted themselves onto the electromagnetic field that's surrounding us. I mean, maybe the electromagnetic field is the universal consciousness field that, that I talk about sometimes. 
I mean, if we're all energy, then they are as well. And they're just as able to interact with the world as we are since we and they are all energy either way. They just interact with it in different ways than we do in these meat suits. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist, right? And that's the, I guess that's the best way to, to think about spirits in, in, in relation to a, a scientific viewpoint of things. If, for instance, this is how it goes, then that may be the the way that they interact with everything is through the electromagnetic field, which is actually all the way of our consciousness interacting with everything that's around us. <clears throat> now, now, one thing I wanted to touch on with all of this as well before my time runs out, which I'm running really low on time here, but one thing I wanted to touch on as well is the idea of empathy and, and people who are empathic. It's It's another subject that I have a, a close relation with because I am myself and with the, the ideas of consciousness and the way that, that empaths interact with the world, the way that I see things is that the um, people who are empathic are essentially just using uh, the senses in a way that I guess is a little bit extended out. It goes into that whole tetra, uh, tetrachroma, uh, tetrachromatic type of idea where the, um, there, there's maybe just a little something tweaked or a little something tuned a little bit differently. And essentially, if you think about this, the, um, energy that people put out, I mean, emotions are energy. They are very potent and people can sense that. I mean, how many people have done experiments over the years where, where people are given the evil eye and, and people can actually feel that eye they feel when people are watching them? It's the same thing. There's no difference between the two. Sensing someone else's emotions is just the same as knowing when someone is staring at you or, or hearing your name from across the room, even though there's so much noise in between, it's just being able to pick, be picked out in between there. There's nothing more, uh, woo woo or dramatic about it than that. It, it's really just as simple as that. It's just a little slight tweak that you're able to then sense the things that are going on around you. It's really no different. There's nothing as woo woo and out of sorts than that. So guys, I am unfortunately out of time and I wish that I wasn't because this is a really good topic. This is a really good subject and there's a lot more to it that, that really needs to be said. But we'll get to that again in, in another episode because, well, as I said at the beginning of things, this is a topic that really endlessly fascinates me. I wanted to speak real quick, though, real fast. You know, remember prayer, meditation and intention. They're all ways that our consciousness interacts with everything around us. We can make a vast change. We can make a vast difference to the way that things go just by us consciously changing our mindsets and putting forward a new way of being. So guys, if you want to email me, you can send it to feedback at openeyesnetwork.com. If you want to go to the show notes for this show, you can go to openeyesnetwork.com forward slash OE064. If you want to find me on Facebook and Twitter, you can find me at Open Eyes Network or uh, find me at Ira Robinson. Uh, guys, Friday, I am going to be talking about the Lucifer problem, and I am really looking forward to that show. I hope that you guys are too. It starts at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on LateNightInTheMidlands.com. Stick around with us. Uh, Michael Vera and Ryan Gable will be bringing us the last frequency since it is Wednesday. And guys, until next time, keep safe out there and have fun. And remember... I love every one of you. Thanks for listening. Remember, tune in Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, late night in the Midlands.com. <laughs>